the writer, director, producer of Avatar, Mr. James Cameron. Whoa, that was a hell of a warm-up. Everybody's always asking, where have you been? Well, that's where I've been. And Dora. I want to bring somebody out right now that's uh, been a good friend and, and uh, working partner with me for a long time. He's the producer of Titanic and he's the producer of Avatar, John Landau. Thank you, Jim. Uh, they've asked me to sort of try and moderate a little Q&A, but I'm going to start with you. Where do you think of this shit? <laughs> Well, it's, uh, you know, what I was talking about before, all those science fiction books and comic books and everything and all the movies that just kind of went into a blender, and uh, this is what came out, you know. But I think that, honestly, I don't think of it all, you know. I, I propose a creative problem to a group of the world's best artists, design artists, and, uh, you know, we sit in some, some uh, ugly, stuffy little rooms for, in this case, a year and a half, designing... Uh, you know, every creature, every blade of grass, every plant, tree, hard surface vehicle, everything. And that's one of the, the, the big thrills for me on this type of movie, is to get to design all this stuff and to be a part of that art team, just to be, just to be part of a team and to get to work with people that talented. So whatever I imagine, it's, you know, it's 200% of that by the time it gets to the, uh, gets to the screen. Well, what, what has always impressed me just as a fan about your movies is not just the worlds you create, but the characters you put in those worlds. And, and the characters are only as good as the, the cast that's there. And uh, we're lucky enough to have some of our cast here with us today. Um, someone you've worked with before plays Grace Augustine in this film, uh, Miss Sigourney Weaver. Today, and I just want to start by just thanking you, frankly, for loving movies as much as you do and for believing in them the way you do, for caring about every single luscious detail because believe me, this is the movie you've been waiting for. Now, I play Grace Avatar, uh, Grace Augustine. She runs the Avatar program, she's a botanist. Um, and this is in, on the distant world of Pandora, which is a world, as you can see, of wonders, of thousand-foot-tall trees and floating mountains, incredible creatures, some beautiful and some, as you've just seen, incredibly terrifying. Um, Grace loves Pandora with all her heart. She hopes that she can somehow protect its indigenous people, the Navi, from the forces of industrial earth. And to do this, Grace and her team project um, their consciousness through link technology into their avatars, which are living, breathing biological bodies which resemble the Navi. And in this form, she hopes to gain their trust. Now the Navi, they are 10 foot tall, they are quick, they are stealthy, they're fast, they're blue as a baboon's butt, and they are lethally dangerous. But their technology is primitive. On the other hand, my people have state-of-the-art weaponry and aircraft. Point is, the situation stinks. It's been coming to a head for a long time, and bottom line, it's not going to end pretty. I'll talk to you later. Colonel Miles Choir, Stephen Lang. And next to bring out on stage is our leading lady, both beautiful blue and beautiful in life, Zoe Sabah. Oh dear, as in uh, the words of the Navi when they greet, Mingati uh, Kame. That means hello, I see you. And um, hi everyone, I'm Zoe Saldana. As you just saw in those clips, I play Neytiri, a princess of the Omati Kaya clan. My character was, literally it was, it was the most physically demanding role I've, I've ever done and I trained for months before production started to bring the grace and power to Neytiri that the story needed. 
I wanted her to be a female action character, at least equal to the others in Jim's movies. Mm. Nadiri hates the humans for what they are doing to her world, but she finds herself completely fascinated by Jake, who is not like any other human she's met before. The relationship that develops will change the history of Pandora forever. One person in our cast that we want to hear today who could not be here with us because he's actually working on another film, but uh, he, he was kind enough to record a message. Um, Sam Worthington. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember he asked me my level of tolerance when we first started planning and strategizing on how the training was going to be. And I'm like, sir, you're going to push me until I say stop. He's like, okay. It was literally seven days a week. I was taking wushu training, archery that I still now practice, um, horseback riding, extensive dialect uh, uh, training. I was also lifting some weights for, with Sam for solidarity, and um, and it, it, it endured the you know throughout the shooting because after he created these two little monsters and Sam and I and we became so addicted on, and, and wanting to come to work that if our call time was 7 a.m. we would be on set at 5:30 because he brought in this trailer gym and we would just be like pumping iron like a la Schwarzenegger <laughs> outside the set and by the time we would get, you know, put our dots on our suits we were so pumped and, and, and this world was just, it was really alive for us so we, we enjoyed every minute of it. What about the language though? Oh my gosh, the language was amazing. It, it was definitely, um, it was hard because it, they, they, I thought I was just gonna, it was like picking up French or something. But the sounds that we were doing were very much like Navi. It was, it, they were, what do you call them? It was, um, like glottal stops. It was like, a, you know, a, a widow to it was, it was all these sounds that we were making. And then to talk English with a Navi accent was like, all right, can we just rewind here for a second? It, it was it was very interesting. It was and and um, and life learning almost. It took two to four years for you to make this movie. I wanted to know what made you say now is the time to come out with it. I think it was it was kind of like knowing that the rain cloud is ready to rain, that the technology could be made to happen, but also just wanting to do something. Maybe, I don't want to say important because it sounds now like you're making a documentary or Inconvenient Truth or something like that, but something that, that uh, has the spoonful of sugar of all the action and the adventure and all that, which thrills me anyway as a fan, but also wanting to do something that, that has a conscience, that maybe in the, in the enjoying of it makes you think a little bit about the way you interact with nature and with your fellow man. Because I think it's going to be easy for people to look at Avatar and say, "Okay, this is a this is a war, this is a battle between those between those nasty industrial humans and those beautiful spiritually evolved Navi." But it's really not because we make science fiction as human beings for human consumption. So what does it really mean? You know, it means that the Navi represent something that is our higher selves or our aspirational selves, what we would like to think we are, or maybe what we realize that we're losing and that the humans in the film, even though there are some good ones uh, salted in, represent kind of what we know to be um, that part of ourselves that is trashing our world and maybe condemning us to a, to a grim future. So it's really two aspects of ourselves that are in conflict in this film. I think that's about all the questions we have time for from the floor, but... Uh... Good questions, guys. Thanks. <laughs>